Phil, that was uh, Paul Mueller Ortega, uh, a real uh, academic, uh, also uh, uh, somebody who is deeply committed to spiritual practice. So not just looking at it uh, theoretically, but uh, practically in his own life. But he, you know, he went into some areas today that you are more familiar with than I am in terms of Indian philosophy, and uh, you know, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and and uh, all the different avenues and angles on uh, spirituality. So uh, fascinating guy. I'd like to talk to him again, and uh, yeah, went really in depth. Yeah, um, we should modify what you just said to say former academic because he right. he left he left uh i uh I, you know probably a nice secure comfortable position in academia right. which is not hard to walk away from but um i he's not the only uh practitioner scholar that i've spoken to who um yearned to be in a, an environment where he could uh, be himself and and speak from what he knows and what his experience is and help people develop spiritually rather than uh, have to be constrained by uh, academic requirements. I know uh, an academic who is uh, also a medita meditation teacher and uh, wanted to uh, instruct his students in meditation uh, to give them a taste of what they were studying and received a lot of flack for it because it, it was interpreted as a proselytizing for religious views. Interesting. You know, for, for me, it would be difficult to imagine somebody that, you know, uh, really uh, a scholar in the area of Zen Buddhism uh, without practicing some meditation, trying to have some experience of it. You're reading about it all the time. It's anything uh, in terms of uh, somebody who is looking at uh, the Hindu faith and and going deeply into uh, the spiritual practices and exercises they engage in, I mean, uh, how could one's curiosity not lead them to at least experiment with it somewhat? And I don't see yeah. why that's any problem. But I can also see, you know, you're teaching comparative religions in, in a university and somebody uh, gets a particular interest in Buddhism or whatever, and you uh, give them some direction in that area or direct them to somebody, and then others, people, com people complaining that, well, if you're going to do that for uh, Buddhism, you have to do it for Christianity and all and all like that. Uh, I think it's small. Well, they, small they might. Yeah, but I mean, they could probably do that privately by referring mm -hmm. people outside, but to, to do it in a classroom and teach one form of, instead mm -hmm. of others might be, you know, they might regard that as proselytizing. Right. Um, we've spoken to other academics who have addressed that subject, mm -hmm. um, and some of them are, you know, do provide uh, spiritual experiences, but they do it in an eclectic way. They bring in uh, people from different traditions. They have people go do field trips to different uh, uh, places uh, to get that taste. There's a kind of um, what you said about people teaching a course in Zen, no one would blink about them being a, a Zen practitioner. And of course it's true in, Christ, in the mainstream religions, mm -hmm. Christianity and Judaism and Islam, one expects a Jew or a Christian or a, um, uh, a Muslim to teach those courses. There's something about Hinduism and, uh, that's been a little different for a whole variety of reasons. I, I would refer people to our interviews with uh, Jeffrey Long and mm -hmm. Rita Sherma. Rita we discussed that. But Paul's, um, you know, very interesting also because he um, he's a deeply grounded scholar of Kashmir Shaivism, and, you know, and that's a fascinating area of study because it's. Uh, it's a tantric tradition, and, and he helped clarify a lot of, right. uh, what we think of uh, things about also, it. Also, Phil, I wanted to ask you, he mentioned, you mentioned to him that there was one teacher uh, of the past that uh, uh, you were, were surprised you were not uh, so familiar with, nor yeah. for many people, and yet it's somebody that uh, he's uh, spent a lot of time studying and probably now is probably the world's leading authority on that. He, well, who he, Paul? He may no. I'm, I, I don't know if that's true or not. But there's certainly uh, you know, not that what, many. What teacher was academics. that? What was the name? Ab Abhinavagupta. 
Mm-hmm. Abhinav, I, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Abhinav Gupta. It's A B H I N A V A G U P T A, and uh, you know he was a sort of in the uh, uh, medieval period of around a thousand uh, A D, and um, you know in Kashmir. You know, and it's not surprising that something brilliant and deep and wonderful would come out of Kashmir. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet, you know, high mountain areas in the Himalayas. So, um, but apparently, uh, you know, for whatever reasons, we're, most of us, you know, we're familiar with a lot of the great sages of India, Shankara, Veda Vyasa, uh, Patanjali, and you know others, um, and and we're familiar with the texts like the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, but there's so much that we're not familiar with yet, so much that hasn't even been you know translated adequately into English. And Abhinavagupta and his work, you know, I just came of, I heard about it fairly recently, but other people have known about Kashmir Shaivism for a long time. What, 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 what's but, unique about his angle on it, and was he, did he have anything to do with the Shankara tradition or other traditions of India? Was he on his own? Uh, I don't, where did I don't what's know the lineage? enough. Yeah. I don't know enough to say, but I did, one of the questions I asked Paul was how it related to Vedanta. Mm-hmm. And that gets complicated because, you know, Vedanta, as we've known it, as, as Paul was pointing out, it's been a, a monastic tradition heavily oriented toward the renunciates. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that might be uh, that a lot of these teachings had to go the householder uh, ver- versions or the householder applications of Vedanta may have been lost over time and partly because they had to go underground in uh with all the you know, hundreds of years of colonialism by Muslims mm-hmm. and Christians in India, um, so it's you know it's a complicated history. And I don't know all now, the now, answers. K- Kashmir Shaivism is, as he explained it, uh, 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 is non-dualist. Okay. Yeah. What what systems uh, in India, Indian philosophy and Hindu uh, philosophy, are not uh, non-dualist? Well, there's a strain of Vedanta called Dvaita, as opposed to Advaita Mm -hmm. uh, Vedanta, that's uh, kind of a a dualist interpretation. And there's there's something called, uh, I don't want to get into all this, but but there are are dualistic. And we we discussed this with him, and I liked what what he had to say, uh, you know, if everything is one, why do you have to practice anything to get there? And when you get there, <laughs> is it all one? And, you know, how that's going to be confusing and all. And you right. don't need a teacher, but there always seems to be a teacher involved. Uh, <laughs> but in a, dual, in a dualist tradition, uh, what, what is the ultimate uh, 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 state of consciousness that a dualist would come to? Does a dualist Well, that, a- that's, you know, it's very interesting. And I would love to have some somebody with more expertise address that. Because, for example, the bhakti traditions, mm-hmm. like, you know, we've had right. uh, Kr- Krishna devotees like right. Ratnath Swami and others on. And th- those are considered um, dualistic traditions because they always maintain that uh, separation between the, the uh, devotee and the divine and the, the object of worship. So... Uh, but at the same time, if you really get into, you know, the depths of it, they acknowledge the oneness. Right. But as long as we're, but we're also separate. And, and that's the thing about non-dualism. You know, it, it doesn't ignore in, in, you know, the essential teachings of a non-dual tradition does, does not deny like some of the contemporary teachers do that you know there, there's any reality to what we think of as the real world uh, of course it's real and we are you know i'm different from you and you know if i punch you you get hurt and i don't right and um but um but you know we recognize that and we recognize that if you if you're inclined to be uh 
to devotion and worship, you need an object of devotion and worship that has form and substance other than yourself. And so that's part of uh, the deal. And it's enfolded within non-dualism mm-hmm. in, in its ultimate sense. And in a, in a householder tradition, like Paul was describing Kashmir Shaivism, um, then everything is divine. And, you know, your family and your spouse and, you know, the nature and everything is, is an expression of the divine in its infinite forms. And part of the teaching is to uh, awaken to that truth and that reality. Interesting. I mean, um, it's, uh, uh, there are, I, I think now the, especially in the West, uh, I think the non-dualist traditions uh, or teachers are are, do, are you know are dominant. Uh, I think I don't hear a lot of folks, um, you know, giving talks on duality and uh, how it relates to non-duality or whatever. But it, it'll be interesting how that ha- how that unfolds. Yeah, and, and, and in, in think... India, is there? Uh, I mean, you were in India recently. I mean, are these issues that the average Indian has any awareness of or is concerned about? I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I don't, uh, I'm not, it's like anything else. It's like life in America. How many, you know, people go to church, people go to synagogue, right. people do this. How many of them are really deeply grounded in the philosophy of what right. they yeah. do? So the average Indian is very dualistic in the sense that they, they worship, they do pujas mm-hmm. and, you know, they pray in, in their own f- fashion. They want Lakshmi to make you know, help them feed their children, you know, they want Ganesha to remove all obstacles. So there's a lot of dualism in in the uh, attitudes, but how many understand and experience the oneness? That's a, that's something I can't answer. I don't, you know, I go to India, I, I you know, I speak to, um, you know, the tour guides and the... Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and or you know no, but I've I've met with gurus and swamis, and of course they know all this, but I don't have that many co- right just right conversations. Very hard to get your hand people. on the pulse of what's going on with a billion people. But anyway, right. uh, uh, a, a terrific scholar. I uh, enjoyed uh, him very much, and uh, look forward to having uh, uh, Paul back on the show uh, at, at some time in the future. And if you're listening out there and you'd like to hear us going to uh, discussion with him in any, on any particular subject or, or angle that you'd like to hear further illuminated, we're happy to do that. Or uh, if you know other scholars and other folks that might be good to address some of these issues, uh, we'll yeah. also uh, be uh, more than interested. And uh, everything we, uh, all of our information at spiritmatterstalk.com, including how to connect with us. Yeah, and I would uh, just, uh, uh, for... Uh, Paul's sake, uh, emphasized that he's not just a scholar and he's uh, not in, a, in academia now right. and he's t- doing a lot of teaching and I would love to get him back on and, and know more about uh, what he's actually, uh, uh, what methods and practices he teaches in his uh, blue throat yoga. Um, uh, that'll be a good thing to do in the future. Great. Till next time, Phil. See you later. Right.